This is video podcast 36 from learningradiology.com, 10 more great cases, part three. I'm William Herring from Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia. These are unknown cases drawn from the archives of Case of the Week from learningradiology.com. Treat each case as an unknown. They'll involve different organ systems and different levels of expertise. Since the findings have to be visible on the small screen, we'll zoom in on the findings. And don't forget to pause your computer or MP3 player after we show you the case and before we tell you the answer. So this is the first case. It's a 45-year-old woman who fell on the ice. Pause the player and decide what you think. If you noticed that the lunate in the frontal projection had a triangular rather than a quadrilateral shape, and in the lateral projection, the lunate was dislocated in a volar position and no longer articulated with the radius, the blue arrow, then you would have seen that this is a lunate dislocation. Lunate dislocations occur because of falls on the outstretched hand. They are the most commonly dislocated carpal bone, and they represent the most severe form of carpal instability. There is almost always volar dislocation and forward rotation of the lunate. The capitate will frequently collapse toward the radius, and they are frequently associated with fractures across the scaphoid. This is your second case. It's a retrograde pilogram on a 65-year-old man with hematuria. Pause your computer or MP3 player. There is a concave filling defect shown by the white arrow on the leading edge of the contrast in the ureter. And you'll notice that there is dilatation of the ureter distal to the point of the filling defect. This is a transitional cell carcinoma of the ureter. Transitional cell carcinomas are the most common tumors of the GU tract, usually occurring in men over the age of 60. The bladder is 30 to 50 times more often the site of a transitional cell tumor than the ureter or the renal pelvis. On a retrograde study of the ureter, papillary tumors may show a goblet or champagne glass sign, as this case did, in which there is ureteral dilatation distal to the point of the filling defect. This differentiates a transitional cell carcinoma from a ureteral calculus, which usually causes distal spasm and narrowing. Here is your next case. It is a 45-year-old man with back pain. Pause your player. In this case, the sacroiliac joints are both fused, and there are thin syndesmophytes that join each of the vertebral bodies in the lumbar spine. This is ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis is the most common spondyloarthropathy. It usually occurs in young, adult, Caucasian males. The sacroiliac joints are invariably involved and are the hallmark of the disease. The fusion is usually bilaterally symmetrical. And in the lumbar spine, we see marginal syndesmophytes, ossification of the outer fibers of the annulus fibrosus, producing the so-called bamboo spine. This is the next case. It's an esophagram on a 29-year-old with dysphagia. Pause the MP3 player. You'll notice that there are multiple linear plaque-like filling defects as well as plaque-like linear ulcerations, producing a somewhat shaggy appearance to the esophagus. This is the typical appearance for candidiasis of the esophagus. Candidiasis is the most common infectious esophagitis. It usually occurs as an opportunistic infection in those with diminished immunity. It produces slightly raised longitudinal plaques, usually in the upper third of the esophagus, but it can involve the entire esophagus. These plaques may coalesce and form the shaggy appearance to the esophagus. 
the more fulminant form of candidiasis is more often associated with AIDS. This is your next case. It is a 68-year-old with a cough. You're looking at a chest x-ray. Pause your computer or MP3 player. This soft tissue density in the right hilar region is unusual because of its relatively straight edges and 90 degree angles, which mark it as a manifestation of radiation fibrosis. Radiation fibrosis occurs when there is damage to the lung secondary to radiation therapy. It usually requires in excess of 45 gray or 4500 rads and it's especially common if more than 60 gray or 6,000 rads are given in a five to six week period. It is more frequent if there is concurrent or even chemotherapy administered after the radiation. It generally appears within six weeks to six months following the radiation therapy and it is confined to the radiation portal. This next case is a 14-year-old with knee pain. There is a lytic geographic lucency in the epiphysis of this growing child. It has a sclerotic margin and it has some flex of calcification within it. This is the typical appearance of a chondroblastoma. Chondroblastomas occur in the epiphysis before the cessation of enchondral bone growth. They are geographic lucencies with a sclerotic margin, occasionally containing calcifications. They occur in the growing epiphysis, and 50% of them occur around the knee. A similar appearing lesion in an adult is usually a giant cell tumor. This next case is a CT that is performed with oral but not intravenous contrast. It's a 45-year-old woman with weight loss. Pause the player. There are numerous calcifications, some of them intraparenchymal as the white arrow is showing and some of them on the surface of the liver, the red arrow, or the surface of the spleen, the yellow arrow. These are calcific deposits from metastatic ovarian carcinoma. Calcified liver metastases usually occur from mucin-producing tumors of the GI tract, colon, or stomach, or the GU tract, ovary. Other causes of liver calcifications include granulomatous diseases such as TB. The calcifications would be much smaller than in this case. Large hemangiomas can occasionally calcify. Hepatocellular carcinoma can calcify, and when it does so, should calcify eccentrically. And the conococcal cyst can sometimes calcify in a curvilinear fashion. This is a PA chest radiograph of a 57-year-old with syncope. Pause your computer or MP3 player. There is prominence of the ascending aorta, shown here by the red arrow. The descending aorta, the white arrow, is normal. And the cardiothoracic ratio is normal. The heart is not increased in size. These are findings that should make you think of aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis most commonly is secondary to a degenerated bicuspid aortic valve. Secondly, it may be due to degeneration of a tricuspid valve later in life or rheumatic heart disease. Valvular stenosis is the most common location for aortic stenosis. The classical clinical triad is angina, syncope, and shortness of breath. On a chest radiograph, we may see a prominent ascending aorta secondary to post-stenotic dilatation from the turbulent flow and the eddy currents. There should be left ventricular hypertrophy, which may not cause cardiac enlargement until the heart begins to decompensate. This is a sagittal reconstruction of a CT scan of the cervical spine in a 34-year-old who was involved in a motor vehicle collision as an unrestrained passenger. Pause the player. 
There is a transverse lucency through the base of the dens. This is a fracture of the dens. The tip of the dens is displaced slightly posteriorly relative to the body. About 15% of all cervical spine fractures are dens fractures. The type 2 fractures which occur at the base of the dens are the most common, 60%. A lateral view on a conventional radiograph is usually diagnostic, although CT may be necessary. The fractured tip of the dens is usually displaced posteriorly, and that produces widening of the predentate space so that it becomes greater than 3 millimeters in size. There may be soft tissue swelling with a distance of greater than one half the AP diameter of the body of C3 anterior to C3 and C2. This is your last case. It's a soft tissue lateral neck in a 16 year old who has a sore throat. Pause the player. There is enlargement of the adenoids, the soft tissues represented at the base of the skull, which are narrowing, the red arrow, the nasopharyngeal airway. This individual also has enlargement of the lingual tonsils, as shown by the white arrow. The adenoids are usually invisible at birth. They then grow slowly through age six and then slowly involute through adulthood. If there is no adenoidal tissue present after the age of six months, then you should think of the possibility of an immune deficiency. If the adenoids are enlarged in an adult, then you should think of the possibility of lymphoma or leukemia. The adenoids are pathologically enlarged when they impinge upon the nasopharyngeal airway, as they did in this case. And they are frequently enlarged in association with enlargement of the paired lingual tonsils at the base of the tongue.